We've been covering this from day one. Now there's another twist. Vince and Linda McMahon named in a ring boy abuse lawsuit. The details of this are hard to hear. Harder for the victims, but it is hard to hear. Okay, let's go to your first profile. According to Rolling Stone, five men who worked as, quote, ring boys for the WWE World Wrestling Entertainment as young teenagers in the 1980s filed a lawsuit alleging that they were groomed for sexual abuse right uh, by ring crew boss and ring announcer Mel Phillips. Now who's Mel? On the left. That's Mel Phillips. And did so on the company's watch. The suit filed by five John Doe's names WWE, the parent company TKO Group Holdings, and WWE co-founders, former executives, Vince and Linda McMahon on the right as defendants. Phillips um, died actually in 2012. So the suit paints a picture of Phillips as someone to whom the WWE gave unfettered access to kids and the means to abuse them, such as private locker rooms. The plaintiff's allegation uh, have evidence already in the public record pointing to ongoing knowledge of the alleged abuse by those at the top of WWE, especially the McMahons. While there are two previously known lawsuits by former ring boys alleging sexual assault against Phillips, this filing marks the first time that the McMahon family has been named personally as defendant. It also directly ties Linda, the co-chair of Donald Trump's 2024 transition team to the alleged cover-up of child sexual abuse at a time when far-right influencers are trying to gin up fabricated pedophilia allegations against Tim Walls, ironically. It gets deeper. On the post, feel Mushnick wrote in March, in a March 1992 column that Vince McMahon had told him that in Mushnick's words, quote, he had let Phillips go four years ago because Phillips' relationship with kids seemed peculiar and unnatural, but hired him back after telling him, stay away from the children. After McMahon and WWE sued Mushnick, and the post a year later for defamation, the veteran sports columnist elaborated in a deposition that McMahon told him that Vince, uh, Vince and Linda returned Phillips to the organization with the caveat that male steer clear of underage boys. Stop hanging around kids. Stop chasing after kids. Now, what do you have here? All right, obviously, the McMahons, they had no real actual morals and ethics according to their own behavior in other matters. But legally you have a negligent rehire, ironically, not even negligent retention. The guy was let go and came back. So you do have a legal basis. The lawsuit was later dropped. The only ring boy known to initiate legal action in 1992 was Tom Cole. Now remember this stretches back. People raced red flag then. But he settled with the WWE in exchange for a $55,000 settlement and a new job. A 1993 suit after Phillips was fired was dismissed for reasons that are not clear based on the public record. Another Ring Boy sued in 1999. By all indications, that case too was settled. Both the new lawsuit and David Bixaspan's uh, 2020 article also cite multiple examples of former WWE personnel indicating that it was actually common knowledge that Phillips was sexually abusing ring boys. Yet WWE's habit of going scorch earth with legal threats and other inference was documented by the likes of the Village Voice, 
and pro wrestling newsletter three count seemingly scared off national uh, legacy media from covering the ring boy story. So they're saying the reason they went out of their way to protect this one guy had nothing to do with the one guy. Damn sure had nothing to do with protecting children. It had everything to do with sending a message to law firms in general or people in general who threatened to sue them in general. You got me? All right. Um, so in the new lawsuit, four of the five men describe abuse taking place the first half of the 1980s with John Doe II saying that his abuse extended into 1989 after Vince McMahon had fired and then rehired Phillips. All five described sexual abuse that began with Phillips targeting them as fans he met at or around shows he was working on or in social situations near his home in Philadelphia. In the complaint, John Doe won a 13 year old in 1981 and 1982 who was attempting to avoid physical abuse at home. Describes a grooming process <clears throat> that began with Phillips giving him access to an arena and locker room area, including a private room over which Phillips had control. The day they met, he alleges Phillips groped his genitals, but tried to play it off like it was a mistake. According to the complaint, a few weeks later, Phillips stripped down to his underwear in his hotel room and, quote, wrestled the boy, suffocating him while disregarding his protests messaging, massaging, excuse me, the child's legs and licking his bare feet. This was the start of an escalating cycle of abuse, John Doe 1 alleges. I told you this was difficult, but much more difficult for these victims. John Doe 1 provides a lengthy and detailed narrative of the abuse. Quote, approximately seven or eight incidents over a 12 to 18 month period after each of which Phillips allegedly gave him money, told him not to tell his parents. The incidents included Phillips ejaculating on John Doe Juan's stomach, quote, painfully man manipulating his feet and then licking them for a long time, forcing John Doe Juan to touch Phillips' own genitals with his mouth and hands and trying to penetrate John Doe 1 after an incident where he alleges that Phillips tried to sexually abuse him and several other boys in a hotel room. Doe says he was so scared that he cut off contact. John Doe 2, 13 at the time, met Phillips outside of an arena. Now we're in Massachusetts, 1984. In this case, Doe alleges that Phillips did not make much of an effort to groom him, groom him, quote, after talking about wrestling, Phil said he wanted a favor and to follow him to the dressing room, according to the complaint. Quote, once there, Phillips threw him to the ground, got on top of him, took off his shoes, and began pulling and twisting his feet and toes in a painful way. Phillips also put John Doe II's feet near Phillips' crotch, and it felt like he was sexually aroused. Phillips also pressed his hands against the buttocks and groin of John Doe II. We have evidence of pattern behavior. In the complaint, John Doe II alleges that Phillips continued with similar abuse in other hotel rooms and private arena locker rooms, recording the abuse on his video camera. Quote, Phillips would be able to grab and fondle his feet and body, including touching his buttocks between the legs and in the groin, the complaint adds, embedding a photo of Phillips pinning him down with his knee bent back and his foot in Phillips' face. Quote, John Doe II witnessed Phillips similarly abuse other young boys, the complaint adds after the photo. He also alleges that Phillips took photos and videos of the abuse. John Doe III was living in a foster home, Pennsylvania. When he met Phillips in the early 1980s, 
When they met, Mel explained who he was, asking if he liked wrestling. Helped him meet a couple of wrestlers and offered to take him to Philadelphia for a show. Reads the complaint. Phillips would pick him up and drive him to Hamburg, Pennsylvania, where the WWE did tapings. WWE's final taping in Hamburg was on May 30th, 1984. So it suggests the abuse took place before then. Quote, Phillips wrestled him to the ground, started squeezing and twisting his feet to make him submit. Reads the complaint's description of one hotel room incident. While wearing nothing but a small t-shirt and underwear, Phillips then got rougher by pinning him on his back. Phillips then rubbed his genitalia on John Doe three's legs and feet until he orgasmed. After they fell asleep in the same bed, John Doe three alleges that Phillips grinded up against him until he orgasmed while repeating, quote, it's okay, it's okay. This is just, this is sick. The next morning, Phillips drove him home and paid for him, paid him for his ring crew work. The plaintiff alleges that Phillips would sometimes give him soda that tasted different than normal soda and caused him to become lightheaded all as a pretext to further sexual abuse. As with John Doe too, he claims that Phillips shot photographs and videos of the abuse. A confidential witness cited in the complaint described as being a sibling of one of those friends echoed their allegations in an interview with Rolling Stone. The witness recalls that on multiple occasions, she witnessed how Phillips would drive into her street, watch the boys play and show them WWE championship belts that he kept in his car. The witness asked that after Phillips take the boys out, they sometimes return drunk. Put up the picture again. Um, obviously, he lived his life as a monster. I, I have no bone saying that. But he was amongst monsters who also decided to empower him. You have to understand how important Phillips would seem to a kid, okay? And he used that disguise. The people who gave him the disguise may not have known he was a pedophile when they hired him, but they damn sure knew he was one when they rehired him, according to the testimony on record. Providing this sick cause and effect relationship where at the end of that are damaged young souls. Damn right they need to have responsibility here as well. This is the thoughts. It, this, this case is just horrific and it is a pattern. We're not talking about just one victim or two victims. We're talking yeah. about multiple victims over the course of years, almost a decade. And their justice that they're, they're attempting to get now is even curtailed because he, Phillips isn't even alive anymore right. to answer for his crimes and what he did. And the McMahons enabled that. Because even like you said, if they didn't know initially, they knew after. And WWE meant so much to kids. They loved it. It's safe haven, it's fun, it's wrestling, um, it's guys in funny costumes. They know that the privilege and the access they, they have to kids and they abuse that power for just in the worst ways. And it looks like it was a case of greed because once he sued, they let him come back and they knew what he was doing and they did nothing to stop it. No one did anything to stop it and no one protected these boys. It's, it's horrific. It is, um, as I said, very difficult story to talk about. And I know it's difficult to watch and I have to remind myself, my producers have to remind themselves that the victims deserve the voices that we provide. 